Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 in your touchstone phone and please record your name after the prompt. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I will turn the meeting over to Mr. Safa Aima. Sir, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in, in the world. Um, I, I'm sure we have uh, participants from all over the country and out in the Pacific. Uh, apologies for our late start. Um, we, we are, you know, trying to catch up with the times and, and get uh, techni technically savvy on our end, so apologies again for the late start. My name is Sefa Aina. I am the um, Associate Dean and Director of the Asian American Resource Center at Pomona College. I'm also the board chair for EPIC, Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, and the former um, uh, vice chair for the uh, White House Initiative for the, the Commission on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And I'd like to welcome you all to the first of what we hope to be a series of webinars that begin to look at um, the issue of higher education in, in our Pacific Islander community, particularly how it can help to transform our community. Um, there's a, a, a Psalm 1 proverb that I like to sort of use uh, in my own life. Uh, it goes like this, the path to leadership is through service. And uh, for many Pacific Islanders, myself included, I think it's, it really has been about trying to figure out how our culture and our values that we learn in our home and, and through our parents and through our communities um, can maintain and, and even help to propel us uh, through today. Um, uh, another uh, thing that I'd, I'd heard um, before from some of our community elders is it's not necessary to westernize in order to modernize, but it, it's very uh, important and critical that we retool ourselves um, for the environments that we live in and for the generations that are coming. And so it's really this this conversation comes, I, I believe, uh, at the right time uh, for us to to think about uh, and, and look at and have a conversation around the role of higher education uh, and, and how it can impact uh, the future success of our communities. Um, we have with us some wonderful panelists, folks who um, I've had the pleasure of, of knowing and working with and meeting um, to join us and, and, and talk a little bit about their work and, and their um, interests in this particular topic. Uh, first panelist we have is Akil Vora. He's a senior advisor with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, he's going to talk about and contextualize the current state of education for NHPIs as it relates to the work that he's done through, um, through the White House Initiative. Uh, we also have Dr. Randall Aki, a Native Hawaiian assistant professor of public policy at UCLA. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit from the policy researcher perspective on higher education and the significant role in the empowerment of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Uh, also on the line, we have Cheryl Day, uh, PhD candidate in information policy at the University of Washington um, from the beautiful island of Guam, Samoa uh, sister. She's going to share her perspectives as a, a graduate student um, in, in the process uh, that she's had to go through, both in terms of her personal life and how she sees that relating to the empowerment of herself, her family, and her community. Uh, and then lastly, we have Sabe Nasaivai, a uh, Fijian political science undergraduate uh, student at the University of California in Irvine. Uh, and Sabe is going to talk about one of, some of the many wonderful things that he's uh, done on his campus and in, uh, as well as in the larger community. Um, so uh, with that, I want to uh, turn over to our um, first panelist, Akil Vora. Thanks, Stefa, and thanks to everyone for joining us on the call today. Uh, as Stefa mentioned, I'm just going to provide a brief overview on um, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community and educational attainment and talk a little bit about one specific federal program where we're hoping to work and empower uh, AAPIs. So I just wanted to start off with a little bit of context and note that with each year, the U.S. is really succeeding in educational attainment. We're narrowing the educational gap and increasing high school graduation rates among students of color. Uh, in fact, according to the U.S. Department of Education's 
National Center for Education Statistics, and we call that NCES, high school graduation rates have actually increased by nearly four percentage points from 2011 to 2013. And that's outpacing the growth for all students uh, in the nation. Um, so uh, while we see the high numbers indicated for Asians and Pacific Islanders, there really remains data that is hidden behind these numbers um, that doesn't represent the reality of educational attainment for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander subgroups. So Chris, if we could stay on this slide for a, for a second. Um, so when we speak of educational attainment for the NHPI community, we really celebrate the growth and improvement in increasing numbers of students completing a secondary uh, education. But more importantly, we have to pay closer attention to areas where educational disparities still exist. So it's important for us to look at the data where many NHPIs struggle to achieve educational attainment in college. Um, so at, with the first slide, what we see is that when we look at high school completion rates, and this is the most recent data that we have for a three-year period from 2011 to, to uh, 2013 from the U.S. Census. And we see for whites, the high school completion rate is 94%. For NHPI subgroups, it is uh, much lower. So in the first graph, in the first bar, when we refer to Polynesians, that's kind of census terminology. This includes communities from Hawaii, from Tonga, from Samoa. That middle group of Melanesians where we see the high school completion rate at 25%, we're talking about individuals from Fiji, from Vanuatu. And for Micronesians, where we see the high school graduation rate at 35%, we're talking about individuals from the Marshall Islands and uh, Northern Mariana. So we can see that for high school graduation rates, NHPIs are, uh, are uh, much below uh, the white population. Uh, next slide. So now what we're looking at in this slide is uh, bachelor's degree attainment, okay? So when we use, we're using whites as kind of a benchmark, we see that the, uh, the college graduation rate is almost 40%. Again, the numbers for the NHPI community broken down in three major categories are much less. So 11% for Polynesians, 13% for Melanesians, and you know, barely 8% for, for folks from, from Micronesia. So I think we have a lot of work to do, and, and this is kind of in a very global way providing us just really, really broad numbers. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So in this slide, what we hope to do is just break out the numbers a little bit more. So we are including both high school completion rate here as well as bachelor's degree or higher compared not only with the white population and the major subgroups of um, Polynesian, Melanesia, and uh, Micronesian, but broken down by specific subgroups. So we're looking at Native Hawaiians, Samoans, Tongans, Guamanian, Chamorro, um, and Fiji. What I also wanted to highlight for you is not just the comparison benchmark of the white population, but looking at other communities of color and examining what their attainment, educational attainment rates are. So when we look at the rates for African American or black, which is second from the left, we see that for many in the PI community, the educational attainment rate falls lower. And the same for Latino. We're seeing that educational attainment rate ends up being a little bit lower. Um, I do think it's a little unfortunate when we talk about the equity agenda when it comes to education that um, this is not talked about a little bit more, right? When we talk about communities of color and we talk about where the disparities lie, this data shows that there are huge disparities in communities that we're concerned about. And I think this information has to be drawn to our community and to, to be drawn to policymakers to ensure that we're part of the conversation 
and there are programs specifically created where uh, we have an opportunity to start uh, enriching the lives of our students. Next slide. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I think there are a range of programs that the federal government offers that uh, target uh, our communities. One of them is the Unappeasy program. So uh, I always joke that this is a horrible name. It's hard to remember, uh, but I think once you get it, you'll never forget it. So um, it's called the Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander Serving Institution Program. Uh, it is a program offered through the Department of Education. It is targeted to two-year community colleges and four-year universities that must meet a specific threshold. They must have a minimum of 10% AAPI undergraduates, and they must, be, they must meet certain um, numbers to qualify that they are serving uh, needy students, okay? In large part, we're talking about the communities, again, that we're concerned about. Uh, a majority of our community are at two-year community colleges. A majority of the institutions that can qualify for this program are at two-year community colleges. Um, so um, we want to make sure that you know about this program um, and also send it to the schools that are in your areas so they could take advantage. Uh, the main goal of the program is to really kind of support institutions and support capacity building efforts uh, for our targeted demographic. There are a range of, uh, of activities a school can utilize, uh, including building um, structures on campus, uh, creating additional mentorship programs, uh, building a curriculum, so there's a lot of flexibility in, in, in uh, ways that we think really benefit our students. Um, our goal at the initiative is to really make sure you know about this information, make sure you are uh, uh, attending the technical assistance webinars, and are encouraging your schools, or if you're at a school, to apply for the program. Um, and I, I think there's some additional information there about what we do. I will say that if you are interested in learning more about this, uh, we work on an Onapeasy newsletter that comes out, I think, quarterly. So please contact uh, your leadership and Christine Harley, who put the webinar together, and we can get information out to you. So next slide. Uh, this is a very simple map. We all also have this on our website. So if you go to the White House Initiative on AAPI's website, we have this information there. The orange areas highlight uh, where AAPI communities are across the United States, right? So in places you would suspect, New York, New Jersey, um, California, um, but also uh, in emerging areas like Arkansas and Utah, where we know that there are a lot of NHPI communities. In addition, the blue markers indicate where these on APC institutions are. Next slide. Um, I just want to give a really quick example before I turn it over. Uh, one of the recipients of the ANAPZ grant is South Seattle Community College. Uh, they received a five-year, $2 million, um, and the second bullet point talks all about what they're kind of doing. I will say the reason why we're highlighting this specific institution and this specific program is because we know leadership there. We know Rochelle who is specifically working with the Samoan population through this grant. And she's working on peer mentoring. She's working on small group cohorts where they put uh, these communities together to study together, to be in classes together. And data has shown that um, we've seen some success in um, how these interventions really help support persistence and college graduation. Um, so. With that, I'll turn it over uh, back to Sefa to talk a little bit more about uh, the other work. But if any individuals have questions about the program or, or data, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Akio. Uh, and we'll, we'll have time at the end of our conversation for, for question and answer. Uh, definitely appreciate you know informing the group about on the PCs. If you're not familiar, if your local institutions are 
actual on a PC um, institutions, you, should, you could definitely log on to the White House Initiative website and, and find out the information there, or the U.S. Department of Education and find out the information there. It's a great program. South Seattle is just one of the many schools that uh, are in a PC school. Uh, many of them are in actually in the Pacific, Hawaii, and, and Guam, and, and other places. So it's a great program. Uh, it's definitely uh, a good start, but obviously there's still a lot more work to do. I think the other thing I would uh, take away from Akio's comments is uh, just where are we in the conversation, particularly on uh, this equity agenda, um, and, and how are we not being talked about, and how are we not being included in these conversations. So uh, definitely good stuff, uh, but again, we will do the question and answer at the end. Our next speaker is Rand Randy Aki, the Assistant Professor at the Department of Public Policy and American Indian Studies at UCLA. Um, Randy? Hi, aloha, everybody. Um, so uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for participating, everyone. Um, I will, um, I guess my my sort of role or my discussion here is <clears throat> to talk about sort of the importance of uh, data and how we use it and how we employ it in, in, in the determination of policy and the determination of uh, program development and uh, how it interacts with the, 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 the information that we just saw, for instance, sort of the discrepancies and the disparities in the educational uh, attainment across these different Pacific Island uh, populations. So I'll just give you a brief background of myself. I'm Native Hawaiian, born and raised in Hawaii. Um, I finished my college degree, uh, was interested in economics, uh, continued on to get a PhD in economics, and the research that I do looks at primarily primarily at economic development. So I do quantitative research, uh, primarily at a microeconomic level, uh, and I'm interested in things such as what what are the obstacles to educational attainment uh, for individual households, and primarily indigenous people's households. So I look at American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiian, Pacific, other Pacific Islands, uh, as well as First Nations in Canada. And uh, and so the, the thing that I'll sort of emphasize is that so now I'm a, I'm a professor, so I've gone through uh, various stages of my own career and my own life uh, as a as a consumer of data, as a as a person who uh, sees data and works with data, uh, I started off a number of years working at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which is an agency in Hawaii that works for the betterment of Native Hawaiians and pursues several different uh, programmatic and and policy driven activities, uh, many of which are you know sort of uh, in order in order to specifically uh, improve the conditions of Native Hawaiians. And uh, one of the things I was keenly aware of while working there is the need for sort of the ability to uh, analyze data, uh, to quantitatively analyze data and come up with recommendations and policies that uh, in a way that can make it understandable to legislators, uh, community members, and uh, staff. And so that was one of the interests of my own, uh, which propelled me to get a PhD in economics because those skills were sorely lacking in many of the agencies and communities that I was already working in. And the idea was to uh, pursue it further because the way the analysis had been done or was being conducted was that outsiders were often doing the data uh, analysis, the report writing, and the consumers of the reports, the the policymakers, the legislators, the uh, program officials, uh, sometimes would have understanding of the data, and sometimes wouldn't, and that's where I think the the disparity exists. This large gap between the ability to understand the method, the data, the underlying variables and names of the, or not names, but the, the measures themselves, and challenge uh, those measures and challenge uh, whether or not those accurately depict the communities that we care about. 
uh, in the ways that we care about and whether or not we're getting an accurate measure of existing uh, existing sort of the, the an appropriate snapshot of the way things are going currently as well as the sort of trajectory of those um, variables and, and outcomes that we care about. And, and so as a, as a professor now sort of at a big university, UCLA, which has a very large Pacific Islander population, I still see that, uh, that the emphasis is less on quantitative of the students. Their inter interests in general are not highly quantitative in nature, uh, although people are students are often very interested in helping their communities. And this is an, an additional way of, of, of helping your communities uh, sort of engaging in data analysis, engaging in uh, getting your feet, uh, your feet and hands wet in some sense uh, with using actual data. And, and I say this uh, because there's a lot of room for improvement in data collection in terms of every time the the census comes out, as well as the American Community Survey, which is an additional uh, census product that happens annually uh, these days. Uh, there is an important need for communities uh, of color in general, uh, but Pacific Islander communities in particular, to get the word out and have people return the forms. Uh, these days, much more of it is being done online. The Census Bureau is sort of uh, um, automating these things uh, so to get people to respond and respond timely and accurately uh, so that people understand what's going on. So there's a huge need for sort of uh, increasing uh, that awareness of the data. But on the other hand, there is an important need for uh, discussions of what variables mean, what it means to capture educational attainment, which is an important variable that we all need to have uh, to measure the, the vitality and the, the level of development of various communities. But there are often other variables that we are miss, missing uh, and, and don't capture, which uh, we also care about uh, in terms of cultural connections and those sorts of things. And these, these challenge the standard notions of data uh, as, presently, as it presently exists. But there's a role for that type of information, social networks, family networks, cultural connectivity, language abilities, uh, traditional knowledge, those sorts of variables and, and, and information is not easily captured in existing data sets and existing surveys. Uh, but there's a real need for that. And there's a role for, for, for students to pursue that and to, to sort of make that uh, an emerging area of uh, an emerging issue uh, in the future. And we, uh, as I said, we have multiple areas that we care about. Just getting basic data is, of course, important. But more and more, there are, there are emerging areas and emerging n new types of questions, new dimensions of, of characteristics that we'd all like to see and we'd like to be able to track the, the improvement or maybe, uh, maybe not the improvement. Uh, in some traditional knowledge uh, over time. And this, again, this information, just being able to tell us where we are and where we're going or where we've been and where we've come from in terms of these various socioeconomic characteristics uh, is really informative and really necessary for building new programs. One of the most, one of the most important uh, pieces of information, I think, that especially for Native Hawaiians uh, that we received in the 1970s was the number of Native Hawaiian speakers in Hawaii it had fallen to less than 10,000 people. And that was really the impetus for the push for the uh, revitalization of the Hawaiian language in Hawaii in terms of the Punana Leo and then after that, the immersion uh, elementary and uh, high schools. And then today where you now have, uh, one can get a PhD uh, at the University of Hawaii in the Hawaiian language, right? And so that was predicated on having the information on, hey, what's the status of Hawaiian language speakers in the state of Hawaii? Where are we? And realizing that there was an issue. And so, again, as I I think the bigger picture that I want to sort of leave everyone with is that the sort of data and statistics uh, can be made useful and can be used in a variety of ways. However, we all have to be, if you want to sort of take part in that, you have to be able to understand uh, what the data is 
and you have to be, have some training in that, uh, in basic methods that exist. And so it's a really, it's an investment, but it's, it's something that will pay off over time uh, and across, across multiple uh, employment opportunities as well. And I think um, the last thing I'll just summarize is, is that, as I said, I'm, I'm an economist, and one of the, one of the places where, that I see both Pacific Island populations but also American Indian populations, other indigenous people's populations uh, uh, groups, is that the, the one area where there's a really sort of low, not a lot of uh, individuals that are capable of, of doing it are quantitative analysis. So one could spend an entire career, uh, could, could train for these careers and spend their entire time working with just indigenous peoples across reservations, across First Nations, across Pacific Islands, uh, helping with data analysis, research, uh, and collection. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Randy. Thank you so much for for uh, your insights and, and sharing your work. I, I um, take away sort of this idea of challenging uh, notions on how data is traditionally collected and to ensure that the data that is given and captured of our Pacific Islander community accurately speaks to the condition of our Pacific Islander uh, families. Um, thank you for, for that. Our, our next speaker is uh, Cheryl Day. Um, Cheryl is currently a graduate student at the University of Washington, Seattle, uh, information in the information department. Cheryl? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I was asked to come and speak to you all about my perspective as a graduate student, and uh, the question posed was, uh, how my experiences through graduate school have contributed to recognition of the significant, significant role that higher education plays in the progress of the NHPI community. And that's a really long sentence. Um, and I wanted to, to kind of pull this apart just a little bit because the question of recognition has two pieces there. There's the recognition of self by myself and there's recognition by others of what higher education can contribute. Uh, what I'd like to do is just go through this, this trajectory of mine by telling you some stories um, of three seeds that were planted very early in my mind. And the first seed was the idea of not knowing one's language. The second seed is that the information that we had was old information. And the third seed was that question of who gets to speak. So a little bit about me. I was born and raised on the island of Guam. I attended public schools. I went to LBJ, uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson, to Money Elementary, Agatha Johnson Middle School, and finally I graduated from JFK. I really loved school. I think I did fairly well. Um, as part of the, the upbringing in Guam, over summers and weekends, I lived with my grandmother over in Sinahanya, and uh, I really loved the time that I spent with her, but my grandmother had very limited English. She had a lot of knowledge, but a limited ability to be able to share that. And so one day while I was really young, we, we went out to go gather some plants because my grandmother made these medicinal um, concoctions, I guess, if you will. And she wanted to, to have me help her pick these plants. And, you know, I would run over and grab a plant, and I would say, this one, Grandma, is this the right one? And she would say, no, not, not that one. And I would pick up another one, and this one, Grandma, this one. And she would say, no, not that one. And finally, you know, I, would, I, I did it again. This one, Grandma, is this the right one? And finally, she just shook her head, and she said, no, I day. You see, Nai, it's because you don't know your language. And at that point, that seed of not knowing my language was planted pretty early, um, I don't think that it impacted me as much then uh, as a young girl as it does now when I've had some time to reflect on that. So that was the first seed. So throughout school, I was really taught this whole idea of being competitive. I did so well in high school and did all the honors courses and all of that. And, you know, the second seed that was planted was one day in high school, I had a physics teacher who uh, the, the class was getting a little bit noisy and, he finally stopped everybody and he 
slammed the book down on the table and he said, you guys, you know something? You guys think that you are all really special. And this was a man that I really looked up to. You know, he was Coast Guard, uh, Caucasian, American, and and uh, taking the time to come and teach us physics. I thought it was really cool. He says, you guys think you're all really special. Well, let me tell you something. When you guys go to the States, you might think that you are really hot stuff here in your honors courses. But when you go to the States, you will all be nothing more than C students. You will be average. And we laughed and we asked, you know, why he thought such a thing. And he said, because look at the textbooks that you guys get. The textbooks that you have are the old discarded textbooks that the schools in the States are getting rid of. You guys have information that's over 10 years old. Second seed was planted. We have this old information. And so you can see that this idea of access to information, access to language and so forth, and the, the things which we cannot have to help us move forward, this was really starting to become a, a, a theme. Fast forward to college. Um, I, I finished college here in Seattle. And uh, post-college, I ran a martial arts school. It's what I do today uh, in addition to doing my Ph.D., but I'd always been into this whole idea of programming and computers, and I had a very, very small taste of that in high school. And when I decided to go back to school, I studied programming and computer science, and I thought I might want to, to develop games and things like that. Um, right after that, I went to work for NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and I did that for 10 years. And at that time, I was their, their sort of their everything techie. I wrote lots of programs to automate um, mapping and data analysis and, and things like that. And during that time, I got to work with many tribes on some of the grants. And I began to ask questions about what happens to the data that we collect as a result of this partnership with the tribes. No answer. So the next question I had was, was well, how do how do people who get to conduct these studies get the money to do that? Why, why do they get to do that? And I realized that there was this thing called the PhD and that those who had the PhD were the ones who could go after those grants and conduct research that was considered credible and do all of that wonderful stuff, basically be at the table. And so there was my third seed and that seed of, well, who gets to speak? So here I am in a Ph.D. program, and all of these things that kind of informed where I am now, um, I sat down with my current advisor and I asked her why it was I should get a Ph.D. because I had no idea what it was. And she, she named a few things, which I think are very important, and they think about them often now. One of those is that they will open doors that would otherwise be closed. Uh, you will learn to speak a language where others who speak that language can can understand and will actually listen. Uh, you develop a network of, of colleagues who you would not have otherwise had access to. And you will be able to participate in this conversation where ideas and ideology are formed and discussed. But importantly for me is the, is the development of critical analyst, uh, analytical skills of policy and of data. And also this idea that was planted in my mind about getting a PhD and then being able to give back, being able to, to be reciprocal with this whole, uh, uh, the background and the upbringing that I had. Uh, currently at the UW I School, the information school, I am part of a, an indigenous information research group. And uh, Zephyr, I just want to correct a little bit. I'm studying information science, but in that program, I am focusing on information policy. Um, and as part of that, uh, I, I've been a lot more active in graduate school than I ever was as an undergraduate, and now it's mainly because I see that I can actually take a significant role. In 2012, Rochelle Fanotti, who you mentioned, is the um, person working under the on a PC grant down there at South Seattle Community College. She and I ran um, the Aspire 2012, which was a, an education summit for Pacific Islanders, and in that. Um, I ran also the, the STEM session because I feel like it is really important for our Pacific Islanders to be able to see the importance of understanding technology, understanding information, and making those things useful because we do live in an age of information. Um, 
other things that being a graduate student has afforded me, I was able to do some really interesting things such as take students of mine to uh, study abroad that I taught courses in Tahiti, and those courses were on oral traditions, knowledge, and science. And I think that um, that was a, an unprecedented way of teaching Pacific Islander cultures, knowledge, uh, what gets to constitute science. Um, I think that, that that has piqued the interest of some of the administrators. But I will tell you that when I came to the information school, when I came to the University of Washington, aside from all of these wonderful opportunities, I did notice that there was a, a big lack of um, Pacific Islanders, the presence of Pacific Islander faculty, that is, and a lack of, um, of coursework around Pacific Islander information, current events, and so forth. So uh, a very good friend of mine, Vince Diaz, planted a seed in my mind when he asked me, what was it that I wanted to do after my PhD? And my answer at that time has changed. I said at that time it was certainly not to be a, a faculty. And I have since changed. He asked me to reconsider that, and I have. And I'll leave you with this, that the, the idea of being faculty for me is that higher education is this space of learning. And really until Oceania and Pacific Islander Studies becomes a reality, the relationship in academia just simply cannot be balanced and reciprocal for Pacific Islanders. The, the space of higher education needs to be a space that includes Pacific Islanders so that they are not simply just consumers, but they are actually peers and contributors as, as faculty, as researchers, as mentors. And in Chamorro, we have a word, and we call this inapomalic, and that is to ensure that everything is, is good, uh, is, is um, in our relationality amongst our communities that what we do is good for the community. And in that sense, I consider uh, the goal of the faculty to be an Uh Thank you. I think that's all that I have to say. Thank you, Cheryl, for, for sharing uh, and, and really uh, talking about uh, reflecting on, on your own journey uh, and, and your future uh, goals or, or plans to um, continue to be an advocate and to be a mentor uh, in higher ed for future students. Um, you know, I think it ties in very well to uh, our kills for slides about uh, where where are we with our with our pipeline? Do we have um, you know mechanisms in place to create more Cheryls, to create more Randys, and 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 other folks who can uh, then kind of continue to inspire and. and and also uh, produce the, the knowledge that's necessary for uh, for our communities to understand ourselves a little bit better, but also for folks who are not Pacific Island to appreciate and understand who we are. Our, our last panelist is Save, um, a student from UC Irvine. Uh, he's a senior in political science and sociology double major. Uh, he's an advocacy chair for the Asian Pacific Islander Student Association at UC Irvine. And he's also been active with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders as an E3 ambassador representing um, Region 9, which is the West Coast region. And he's also a pilot alum, which is uh, Pacific Islander Leaders of Tomorrow, a program that spoke, focuses on our college students, um, asking them to think critically about uh, issues that Cheryl brings up. Uh, where are we in this pipeline? Where are we? In, in places like higher ed, where are we um, with, with regards to leadership in, in, in our communities? And so Save is a, one of our, our shining stars in, in our community, and we're really glad to have him uh, be on uh, the call. Save? Uh, thank you, uh, Safa. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Okay. Mulevinak, uh, everyone. Uh, as Safa said, my name is Save. Uh, I'm a native Fijian, born and raised. Uh, migrated to the U.S. when I was uh, 11 years old with my family, and um, I'm I was asked to sit as a um, representative uh, in the uh, demographics who are also in undergrad right now, um, undergraduate education. So I would just like to share um, just three brief points 
about my experience in academia. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with my uh, migration story. Um, like any other Pacific Islander uh, story, you know, moving to the U.S. was uh, was something that uh, really changed my life for me for for the mere fact that um, my parents, my grandparents, saw this as an opportunity. Uh, for us to excel, for an opportunity for us to um, access um, resources that were not available to us uh, from our sending countries. So having, uh, being a member of a population uh, from the South Pacific that's relatively new in its migration, um, I have a lot of uh, things to talk about uh, with respect to uh, the difficulties that I faced and the challenges uh, I faced in my um, journey in academia. So uh, I'd like to just talk about my motivation uh, for getting to where I'm at today. Um, first of all, coming to the U.S., being a first generation, I um, mean, second generation uh, Pacific Islander American, I, um, we, we, we have this uh, problem, uh, not problem, we have this uh, issue of uh, being, you know, being injected into a new system, having a culture shock, and um, not, uh, you know, being injected into this individualistic system, coming from a communal system was was really a shock for me. So um, my parents were always working all the time, so they they were working two to three jobs uh, upon coming to the U.S. So most of the time, you kind of have to just, you know, step up and 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 do your own work, your schoolwork, having to also cater to the needs of your younger siblings. So that was the, the common challenges that I faced uh, in my journey through education. But I also used these challenges to turn it into a um, a form of motivation for me, you know. Um, they didn't leave uh, their livelihood, their whole livelihood, their families behind so that we could come here and just settle for mediocre, mediocrity because that wasn't um, an ideal. That wasn't a value that my parents and grandparents uh, believed in. They always believed in excelling. You know, every generation should excel uh, to, to go up more and, you know, go up another level. So having uh, those kind of challenges when I came here, um, I didn't receive a lot of uh, resources in uh, middle school and high school, and so far as to, to stay back, you know, and get SAT helps, a ACT helps, get resources from the counselors, get resources uh, with with homework help at school because you you always have to come back home and cater to the needs of your family. So you kind of have to just do these things on your own. And and I feel like even though I wasn't born here, these ch challenges are still being realized. Are still uh, being faced by uh, people in our community who are even, you know, who are born here. So uh, I would like to just encourage everyone, you know, take the initiative, look out for someone. If if you've been through it, go back and, and teach them and, and provide guidance for them on how, how we can do this. We don't have the luxury of time. We don't have the luxury of money uh, to, you know, to stay back at school, to, to engage in other extracurricular activities that builds our skills. So um, in saying that, uh, my second point is accountability. So being accountable to my parents, being accountable to my grandparents who had no form of formal education at all, but I felt like their resiliency, their um, their perseverance, and the fact that they believed that there was a whole new world out there for us, a world where we could, you know, uh, not be limited by our circumstances, but the fact that we can always pursue uh, greater things. That was one of the things that always motivated me, the fact that even though these people, the people that came before us didn't have uh, much to settle for, um, they, they, they made the best of their situation. And I felt that that resiliency translated into, into the things that I turned into motivation, things that I turned into, uh, you know, I turned my excuses into, I'm going to do this. this. There's no excuse. So, so you know, the saying... It's either you make it or break it. For me, there was no breaking it. You know, I, I, it's either I make it or there's nothing at all. There's no other option. Uh, thirdly, um, I never saw myself in 
tertiary education. I never saw myself in post-secondary education. But like I said, the fact that uh, people that came before me had a much bigger vision than me, I felt that I would do not only myself an injustice, but to them, you know, their sacrifices, uh, everything that they've been through, uh, partying, coming to the U.S. and leaving behind uh, part of ourselves that, that are endemic to us, our culture, uh, having an environment that, that was homogeneous and, and you could relate to everyone. So I felt that uh, there wasn't an, an excuse that I could make for myself. And secondly, um, another thing that I would like to talk about are the barriers and the challenges that I face. So um, first, I would, I'd just like to uh, comment on my problems in, in um, my journey throughout education, my educational career. Um, first of all, navigating education system. So, like I said, there were no resources available to me uh, with these resources. I never uh, actually received um, a sort of uh, guidance from what I'm, I'm seeing right now through the pilot program through EPIC, a community-based organization that caters specifically to me as a Pacific Islander that caters to, to the cultural uh, um, things that we value and things that complement our learning experience, things that we see. Because being in the U.S., having to integrate into this new system, you kind of have to adopt a whole new, um, you know, sets of ideologies that are, are foreign to you as a Pacific Islander. So when, when you don't relate to the curriculum, when you don't relate to the, uh, the teachers that are speaking to you, when you don't relate to the student populace, naturally your, your um, ability to learn kind of gets... Um, it gets clouded in a way. So that leads to my second point of representation. So when I made it to um, UCI, I didn't see a lot of uh, Pacific Islanders on campus. So last year, with a uh, student population of 28,000 plus, uh, there are only 28 um, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders uh, here at UCI. So that's not even 1% of the student population. And, and with that, the resources here having uh, no sense of communal identity on campus, uh, it made me re-question, re-evaluate my decision to even come uh, to tertiary education. And uh, uh, the fact that I realized that even though we were getting to uh, post-secondary education, uh, the retention rates were very low and, and there were no sort of institutional uh, system in place that provided uh, these, these um, uh, retention help, these uh, outreach programs to our high schools, these uh, sort of uh, even classrooms. So, so this leads to my, my, my last point of having this culture of reticence. Uh, when you're sitting in a classroom setting, for me personally, I always had this, uh, I guess, cultural constraint where I feared speaking up in class and asking questions. Which, which kind of uh, became a barrier for my uh, learning process. When you don't ask questions, you, you are left to your own demise to, to kind of figure out things on your own. And uh, I, I didn't feel the need to ask my peers because I didn't know if anyone related to me, if anyone related to uh, the, the fact that I didn't understand a certain concept. So that's why uh, I feel that there is a need for us to be here in higher education for a myriad of reasons. And um, having gone through all this, it made me realize that uh, we need to be here. We need to uh, be in areas areas in, in, in policy making to incorporate our cu curriculum and all levels of um, the education system. Uh, this includes uh, ethnic studies classes because it'll give our people validity uh, to want to learn. It'll give them uh, the fact that uh, what they're learning corresponds to their life, you know, that it's not uh, what they're going through, the challenges they're going through are not isolated. This is everything that we went through as first and second and third generation uh, Pacific Islander Americans in this country. So with these policies, we can develop programs and, and uh, kind of resources that are relevant to us. For example, the, as Sefa mentioned, um, me being a, a pilot um, alumni, Pacific Islander Leaders of Tomorrow, they had a lot of um, 
different ways to cultivate our learning, you know, to cultivate us into the leaders that they see in our people uh, by injecting in, by incorporating uh, different different sorts of, you know, cultural uh, elements that complemented what we learned in the classroom. And just the fact that we have this space uh, to help us, the space to be... Um, to talk about our learning process and where we're at in, in so far as education and health and economic and social justice is, is just something that I, I wish I would have had coming up. And just to conclude, um, in achieving all of these and, and the fact that uh, being one of the E3 ambassadors, I still have feel an innate obligation to go back, you know, to go back into the community, to go back into high schools, you know, high schools I was brought up in. And, and attend uh, communal gatherings, you know, civic islander gatherings, and tell them that, hey, I've made it through. Um, I may not have made it all the way, but I'm, I'm at a place that I could offer you guidance on where to make and what to do. You know, make choices, certain choices that can that, that are different to what uh, I made growing up because I didn't have that kind of guidance or resource uh, from just people around me. Thank you. Thank you, Sabe. You know, I, I I went to college a little over 20 years ago as an undergraduate, and a lot of things you're saying still resonate. Uh, this idea of being a college student and how much that is a sacrifice, um, not just for you as an individual, the work that you're going to be uh, enduring, but also for your family and what that could mean for them. Um, also, uh, talking about sort of how looking at our, our community and our culture and our elders from an asset-based approach uh, when you spoke uh, specifically about the resiliency and the perseverance of your elders. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for, for your comments. Um, at this point, we do have uh, – we did start a little late, 10 minutes late, so hopefully we can push our Q&A to at least um, uh, that long. Um, but we do have some questions that came through. Uh, let's see. So, for um, Randy uh, specifically, uh, could the lack of student quantitative interest be due to generational differences? Are students today just not interested in data collection, or is it specifically a lack of interest in data collection of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander people? Randy, could you respond to that? Uh, sure. I mean, I don't. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a generational thing. I'm not certain if the generation previously was that interested in it either. <clears throat> in reality, there there just wasn't a lot of data at the individual level uh, available to do much of this analysis anyway. So this is kind of an emerging, a new area uh, that's even possible these days. So it's. I mean, from my perspective, I think it's uh, it's. It's something on the frontier, and you often hear policymakers and legislators talk about evidence-based planning, evidence-based programming. So it's kind of a buzzword, and it's something where governments and policymakers are more interested in it uh, in sort of these evaluations of programs, evaluations of policies. So I think this is not something just specific to Pacific Islanders um, or minorities in particular, it's, it's, it's across the board. I, what I do think, as I was saying, and I think, you know, uh, in order to be able to participate, and I think um, one of our speakers uh, echoed this as well, to participate, at, to be at the table, to be able to be in the conversation, you have to have some of the training and some of the background in order to do that. And, um, so, and, and and I think in our these communities these these particular skills are 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 there's just in less abundance and and there might be fear there might be sort of I, you know again I think, I'm not sure why the answer is that there's lots of obstacles uh, but I think it's it just is in existence there's a great disparity I'll stop there. Thank you, Randy. Um, another question that came in, and maybe I'll direct this to um, Cheryl and uh, Save, or just one of you can answer, or if both of you have something 
you can contribute. One question that came in is, what can we do to change the narrative that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders can only go to school for sports, and how do we start to change the narrative? Um, how do we start to change the narrative into something that encourages intellectualism for young people? And additionally, do all, people find that it is difficult to get families to allow their children to move away? Um, Pacific Islander families tend to be very family oriented, so leaving for school has always been a difficult thing. So um, maybe Evan, I know that was a, a lot of stuff to capture in one answer, but maybe Cheryl and Savi can speak to that. Um, you know, it's it's been a long time since I left home, but I can relate to that. Leaving is is very difficult. Um, I was told by my my father, my mother, all my relatives, um, the question was, why Why do you want to go away for school? You know, we have a school here, and I won't get into the rest of that conversation, but understanding the value of, of education, and now as a PhD, the question I get is, well, why do you want to do that? How is that going to make you money? So there's always that that immediate question about what's that going to be good for in terms of, you know, the monetary value and what you're going to actually contribute back directly to the family, um, it, it's it's something that's quite difficult because a PhD is sort of a it's kind of a lonely, difficult experience. And um, I think in the end, they'll be proudly bragging as as many of our Pacific Islanders families love to do. But um, you know that that leaving a school is just uh, um, that can really weigh heavily on a student anyway, who still doesn't seem to feel welcome in an environment in a in a in higher education. Um, sorry, Sefo, the the next question you had was how we can start to change the narrative, I believe. Yeah, changing narratives of who which Pacific Islander folks go to college and um Yeah. 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 You know, but, There's actually you know, I think that's just gonna have to be a continuous conversation with I've lectured in Rochelle Fonoki's classes down there in South Seattle Community College, and we talk about this often, and it's actually a concern that many of her Samoan students have, is that people look upon them and immediately expect, oh, you must be good in football then. And many of those young men that I spoke with find this troubling because they don't want to be looked at like that. Uh, they, they wanted to create. They wanted to, to make movies. They wanted to write. They wanted to do so many things, but... We uh, and I, when I say we, I mean the collective American society puts this this stereotype on them, and that's all they see on TV is, well, the Samoans are really great in football, and that may be the case, but it's extremely limiting for the potential of Pacific Islanders. Thank you, Sava. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that particular question? Uh, yes. So for me right now, I'm having that that um, problem as well with the community, you know, being able to communicate that in the way that doesn't condescend, uh, that that doesn't come off as condescending to our people. Because it's a very sensitive topic, and just as communal people, uh, that kind of, you know, being being people that just accept things when you're being told. So being labeled as, you know, you're just good at football and things like this. We internalize these things. We never like to challenge it. So I guess in my own uh, personal experience, I have to do it. I, I, I can't just talk about it. I can't say, you have to do education because of this. I have to do it. I have to go through education. I have to uh, show to my people that, hey, you're more than, than hula, hula, uh, hula uh, skirts and, 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 bra, and coconut bras. You're more than football jerseys. You, know, you can do it in academia. And the thing that I learned yesterday, uh, just watching a speech uh, from uh, Chimamanda Adichie, where she was saying that uh, the problem, the dangers of a single story is that uh, where she talks about stereotypes, and the stereotypes are not that they aren't true, but they are incomplete. So by being in academia, by being in tertiary education, we are balancing the view. We are, you know, showing that there's more to us, the, the complete picture, you know. We are more than, than everything I mentioned. We, we can be lawyers. We can be doctors. We can be uh, uh White House ambassadors, we can be, uh, we can form our own organization, community-based organizations that cater to our people. So, uh, by by doing that, we are stretching the limits that we that society even places on us. Thank you. 
I think we've lost uh, Sabe. Sabe, thank you for, for the answer. Um, uh, another question before we wrap up, and we do have to wrap up, is uh, were there any specific institutions that have had programs in their offices that have been successful in serving uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, students? I think Akio uh, and Cheryl have mentioned the work that's being done over at South Seattle Community College. Um, I've also had the good fortune of working with folks here in Southern California, both at Santa Monica College, which doesn't uh, have an NFPC anymore, but when it did, uh, did some wonderful things uh, working with trying to get uh, community college students at Santa Monica College transferring into four-year institutions. Um, out of that program came a uh, partnership with UCLA where they do a summer institute for Pacific Islanders and Native Americans um, and then currently have uh, spoken a few times with the um, folks over here at Mount San Antonio College here in uh, uh, Southern California so there have been some some wonderful examples that I, I, I hear uh, uh, of um, the kinds of support that, that have happened in the Pacific I know that in um, in Guam, Saipan, uh, some of the funds were used to build the capacity uh, of um, the institutions, uh, libraries, um, buildings, smart room classes. Um, and so it, it's not the, the, the beauty of sort of the NAPC program or the NAPC grant is that it's not uh, fixed to programs, it's not fixed to um, tied to any specific uh, way to spend the funds. You can you can use it to do a number of things that you, your organization or your university feels is going to build the capacity of the Pacific Islander students uh, to be successful. Uh, and with that, um, we have to uh, wrap up. I appreciate everyone, uh, everyone being on the call today. I appreciate your patience uh, um, for, with our late start. Um, and this, you know, is, is maybe you could tell, maybe you can't. You know, we kind of just jammed a, a bunch of different folks, uh, a bunch of different voices together because we weren't sure how often we'd be able to do this, and so we wanted to make sure that we uh, were giving as much information and balancing that with uh, a lot of sort of personal stories and anecdotes um, that folks are experiencing now. Uh, in the future, we'd love to, uh, whether it be through EPIC or through a collaboration with the White House Initiative, to host uh, other webinars uh, on different topics in education. If you're interested in, in specific topics, please feel free to email uh, myself, Sefa, Aina, Sefa .aina at pomona.edu, um, and you know we'll see uh, through our networks who um, who we can pull together to try to make some of these things happen. Because I know that this is just the beginning of a conversation, and there are many, many, many more conversations that need to happen. Um, and again, thank you uh, for for your patience and your participation, and um, looking forward to um, talking with you all or uh, in the future and, and helping to. Uh, address uh, some very serious issues in our civic island community. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's conference. You may now disconnect. <laughs>